While it is certainly true that the very basis of this planet is alien in origin, and that our true conception lies at the heart of the Big Bang, it is not so certain that higher forms of intelligence have intervened, with apologies to Xenu, L. Ron Hubbard, and to DC-10 aficionados, in the day-to-day lives of humankind. I can appreciate that there will and should be rigorous debate over these kinds of issues, and that given the vast, even if questionable, array of UFO reports from around the world, we should be careful not to be too cynical or too close-minded to entertain occasionally outrageous hypotheses on this subject. In this regard, I think the skeptic and the believer can agree with Carl Sagan when he beautifully exclaimed, We've begun at last to wonder about our origins. Star stuff, contemplating the stars, organized collections of 10 billion, billion, billion atoms, contemplating the evolution of matter, tracing that long path by which it arrived at consciousness here on the planet Earth, and perhaps throughout the cosmos. In this sense of wonder, I thought it might be useful to take a different route, and go back nearly seven decades and eavesdrop on one of the most celebrated, if not perfectly recalled, lunch conversations in the history of UFO theorizing. Enrico Fermi, the Nobel Prize winning Italian physicist who did prodigious work on quantum theory and the development of the first atomic bomb during the Manhattan Project, unexpectedly asked his colleagues over an informal lunch, where are they? Although each participant has a slightly different recollection of what precipitated Fermi's query, they all agree that it was on the subject of space travel and the purported reality of flying saucers. This in itself is not so surprising since there has been something of a media blitz with the usual conspiratorial hysteria about UFOs since Kenneth Arnold's 1947 flying saucer sighting. However, what was unusual was the inherent implication of Fermi's quip. Given the likelihood that there are suns and planetary systems much older than ours, replete with intelligent life forms, Fermi wondered why we had yet to see evidence of their existence. Surely, if there were such advanced civilizations, presumably dating back millions of years before our own evolutionary advent, then where are they? Later, in 1961, Frank Drake added to Fermi's query by proposing an equation about the probability of advanced alien interaction guesstimating that there may be 10,000 or so communicative civilizations in the Milky Way. In contrast, though, in 1975, Michael H. Hart, in a widely cited paper, An Explanation for the Absence of Extraterrestrials on Earth, extends Fermi's query into a surprising and more radical conclusion, especially among ufologists. The reason we have no ET encounters is because highly intelligent alien civilizations don't exist. Because of this, Hart believes that electromagnetic monitoring for ETs is probably a waste of time and money. And in the long run, cultures descended directly from Mars will probably occupy most of the known galaxy. However, there are many others, including some scientists, that believe that planet Earth has already been visited. One of the most famous scientists in this pantheon was the late Francis Crick, who proposed a variation of panspermia, where small grains containing DNA, or the building blocks of life, could be loaded on a brace of rockets and fired randomly in all directions. The strategy of directed panspermia may have already been pursued by an advanced civilization facing annihilation, or hoping to terraform planets for later colonization. It is not surprising, therefore, that a serious researcher in this area may suffer from an acute case of informational vertigo. Perhaps as skeptics, we shouldn't be too dismissive at this stage about borderline ideas, or even nutty ones. This reminds me of an old friend of mine, Gene Ivish, now deceased, who I first met in North India in December of 1981. Gene was a theoretical physicist at the University of Texas and an expert on the mathematics underlying quantum mechanics. In the midst of our discussions, I was quite shocked to learn that this eminent physicist, well-trained in the hardest of sciences, was an avid subscriber and reader of Fate magazine, sometimes impolitely called the National Enquirer of all things paranormal. Even though I had an article on the Brigu Samitya coming out in that very magazine within months, Gene noticed my obvious bemusement. So I asked him why he would read such a magazine given its somewhat questionable credentials. His answer was both wise and revealing. Gene politely responded that the best tool in any scientist's arsenal is his imagination, and thus it's important not to bury oneself too deeply in a rut by limiting one's reading material simply because it looks undignified. He then punctuated his purview with Einstein's famous quote, Logic will get you from A to Z, 
but imagination will get you everywhere. Years later, I would recall Jean's wise counsel whenever I got too comfortable with my own skepticism. I even gave it a meme. And whenever I start wielding Occam's razor somewhat drunkenly, I remember Ivish's caution and realize anew that time was caught from Hamlet. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy.